your search and say, hey, I'd rather work with a female therapist. Mm -hmm. Or if you have a, a philosophical way, if you're Buddhist or, you know, you have a religion, you can, you know, click that filter too. And if the therapist identifies as that, they'll share that with you. And a lot of the therapists will, they have their own bio. So yeah. you write your bio and you will talk about, you know, kind of your philosophy, yes. um, your modalities or, or therapeutic models that you follow. Um, you can also talk about specialties. Yes. So there are going to be some, uh, there's probably a therapist in your area that specializes specializes with grief and loss. There's probably somebody that specializes with adoption. Mm -hmm. There's probably somebody that specializes in I every one of these. Uh, right. So you can find somebody that, that will fit with what you're going through. So, and I want to circle back to that about what to look for in a therapist, because that was another question she asked. But the very first part of this is if you're out there and you're like, man, I want to try this. How do I find one? Here are the three top ways I think to find a therapist. The very first thing is to go ahead and get, get into your wallet or your purse, find your insurance card. Okay. Pull that thing out, flip it over. On the back side, in almost all insurance cards now, it's going to have a, a, a phrase on there, a number that says mental or behavioral health services and then a phone number. Usually your insurance has hired somebody to do the navigating for you. It's usually a behavioral health company with a bunch of therapists in it. And you call that number and they pick up and they say, hey, are you a member of this insurance? You say, yes. You tell them what you're going through. And then they say, hey, there's three therapists here that specialize in that. Do you want us to book a session? That's the fastest, most efficient way. It's going to cover with your insurance. A therapist session can be anywhere between $75 to $120 for the hour, right? And so with your insurance, it'll usually lower that to your copay, which might be 10, 20, 30 bucks. And that makes it a lot more manageable for you to lean in and really do the work. The downside, though, is that usually you don't have as much say-so in who your therapist is going to be. And so sometimes that can be discouraging. Um, but that shouldn't stop you from going for mm -hmm. it, right? Because we're all trained therapists. We're all better than nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so we're not going to hurt you. And, and I would encourage you to lean in. The second way is a little bit more choosy, which is what Nick talked about, psychologytoday.com. Uh, and you can find therapists. And you can also search by your insurance. And so that helps you zoom in. Um, but also you might find a therapist and you say, wow wow, this is the one I really want to work with. They don't take my insurance. Look them up. They have a profile. They probably have a website. You can also call and do a phone interview. And a lot of people don't know that, Nick, that you can call us. You mm -hmm. can. We'll have a phone number on there. We'll have an email on there. You're invited to call us and say, hey, I wanted to just kind of give you the gist of what I'm going through and get some feedback. And we will have a conversation with you to let you kind of get a feel for who we are, and we'll give you some initial consult. That's a very normal thing to do unless it's a very busy therapist who can't call you back. But, you know, for the most part, we can do that. And that mm -hmm. way you can kind of try us on to see if we're a good fit. And then the third way to find a therapist is honestly it's Google and Yelp. And so like if you go into right. Google and you just type in therapist in my area, um, Google knows how to sort that for you or go to Yelp and type in therapist and uh, type in your zip code. Funny side note on that, I, I always ask my patients whenever they come book me for the first time, I'll say, hey, how would you find me? And at one point somebody goes, Yelp. And I was like, what's a Yelp? And they were like, dude, really? <laughs> and so like they showed me my profile on Yelp and I didn't even know I had one. And like oh, somebody wow. had created it for me and I had like six reviews. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. <laughs> like I'm really oh, glad wow. they were good, thank God. <laughs> yeah. Like I was like, whoa. So I didn't even know that was there. But uh, that's a great way to find people too because you can see reviews from other people that are saying, hey, I enjoyed this person. And uh, I got something from them too. Yeah. I mean, you could also get a referral from anybody that you know that, yes. you know, that has been in therapy too. Yeah. So, but when it comes way. to speciality, and Nick was talking about this earlier, with Psychology Today, we tend to list our specialities. So we'll say, hey, I specialize in addiction or I specialize in women's issues or I specialize in um, grief and loss or trauma. In this case, Heather, I'm going to tell you the truth. I think it's fine for you to search for somebody who does specialize in grief and loss or trauma. But I'm going to encourage you not to make that the most important thing. That's a good factor. But the most important thing, in my opinion, is personality. Mm. The, the research that I have seen is that the most effective therapist for the person is the person that has the personality that you jive with the best. Mm -hmm. And so that's why, unlike, you know, your, uh, your podiatrist or like, you know, your family physician, we go to great lengths to show you who we are. You know, we create a profile on Psychology Today. We have a website where you usually have videos of us talking at you. We'll talk to you on the phone because we know therapy is a very intimate, very personal experience. The most valuable quality you can find in a therapist is that they seem like somebody you could have a cup of coffee with 
And, you know, don't read too much in it. Like they don't have to be a perfect twin for who you are. But if they seem like somebody you identify with that you you find approachable, that's the the best fit for you. And then, you know, make sure that the logistics work out as far as their availability and and, uh, cost and things line up for you. But I strongly encourage you, Heather, therapy is the right fit for your situation. Um, And I would even encourage you, and I said this in the email, I encourage you to get couples counseling, to bring your husband with you to some of this therapy. Maybe start for yourself, but bring him too because he has gotten to ride shotgun through years of grief and trauma, and this has disrupted your family ecosystem. And, you know, respect that and understand that, that he probably has been keeping a stiff upper lip and trying to be strong for you. This affects him too. You know, your heart is his heart. So it might be a good idea to come together at some point and visit with a therapist as well. Mm -hmm. And going back to your comment of, of, you know, am I being too sensitive? No, no, absolutely not. Um, there's no such thing as being too sensitive um, to the point where you don't need therapy. Yes, <laughs> right. I mean, even if even if uh, let's just say hypothetically you were being too sensitive, does that mean you're not appropriate for therapy? Right. No. No. You're too like, sensitive. It's... Go to therapy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in, in am I not either... being too sensitive? No, in, you're not too sensitive. Go to therapy. In either case, I think <laughs> yeah. it's going to be very helpful. And this right. is this. Yeah, this is a lot to deal with. I mean, and why do it alone if you don't have to? That's right. Definitely don't do it alone. And Heather, thank you so much for writing in. Please continue to check in with us. Please let us know how things are progressing. If you do find a therapist, I'd love to hear how you made that choice, you know, and and how things are going as you go. And if you ever want to kind of check in with us and get some feedback about the way to approach your therapist, um, do that. Write back into us, man. We're always helpful. uh, or We want to be helpful to you as much as we can be. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Heather. Salt pork. Salt pork. Okay. Did I do it wrong? Yeah, you did it wrong. (laughs) God, it's two words. It was all wrong. How did I still manage to get it wrong? (laughs) All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we hear from somebody with schizophrenia. You're listening to Pod Therapy. We are back. You're listening to Pod Therapy. This next letter is from a person living with schizophrenia. All righty. And the letter is titled, Happy Mental Health Month from a person with schizophrenia. We added that last bit. (laughs) In the spirit of the ICS community. Ice cream social. Oh, this is another one of those. I know. We got two. Damn. Two in one episode. That's awesome. All right. In the spirit of the ice cream social community. Hello, you beautiful mind (laughs) fuckers. See, this is what I'm talking about. Like, that's probably a joke that I don't get. Yeah, it is. <laughs> like, I don't know anything. She says in parentheses, uh, of course, understandable if that is omitted on air. Yeah, I'll probably be bleeping that in post. <laughs> in the spirit of one of your latest episodes, I feel excited about coming out of the closet. I have been out of the atheist closet since October 2017, but this is a different closet altogether. It's important this month and really every day to be honorable and authentic. So here it goes. I am schizophrenic, proudly, and with great effort every day. I work hard for a better tomorrow, almost entirely, without medications, and always going to therapy every one to two weeks. I do take Ambien because of severe insomnia due to PTSD. After being diagnosed with an MMPI, which is the Minnesota Multiphasic Inventory, scans, and for a few months' daily sessions, I have accepted the reality of the situation. And this part is for those who have never met somebody with schizophrenia. Hollywood is wrong. Thank you. (laughs) Well said. It's not just about voices or whatever the latest SVU episode has people (laughs) believing. I have small disagreements with reality and consistently have opposite effect, emotional non-existence, extreme anxiety to the point of agoraphobia, physical hypersensitivity wrapped in a numb shell, extreme paranoia, that constant feeling like I'm watching myself live my life like an out-of-body situation, functioning mostly on logic with little emotion. I've come a long way. I've been in consistent therapy for five years. I was lucky enough to find a therapist who is someone that uses meds last. He is revolutionizing outdoor therapy in Indiana, and with his help, honesty, and confidence, I am now a functional hot mess. (laughs) (laughs) I'm married to the exact opposite person that I could find. Conservative, religious, happy, grounded. I guess it makes sense with my oppo effect. (laughs) I love him as much as I can. He is very supportive of my 
heathen, hippie, impulsive ways. <laughs> Instead of living in fear in my head, I have learned to use my unique qualities to my advantage. I learned that hospitality industries fit my abilities to a T. I manage a restaurant where I can use my ability to shift personalities and traits, constantly feeling like I'm in a performance anyway. The fast-paced, labor-intensive environment has helped improve my quality of life. I come home exhausted physically, mentally satisfied having experienced a range of anger, stupidity, and hilarity. I know it sounds like coping mechanisms, but it's a step. Yes, I am schizophrenic. But for me, it's not a bad thing all the time. Sure, there are manic and depressive cycles. But then therapy, here we come. <laughs> so there it is. No shame in this crazy game. I want people to know that therapy helps. Meds don't have to be the only answer. I want people to know that mental health doesn't have to be dealt with alone. And loving yourself and your unique differences is vital. I love what you two are trying to do. So keep it going. Betsy. Wow. That's our at Betsy Boop Scoop. <laughs> She's our Twitter friend. Thank you. <laughs> Betsy, that's awesome, man. I did not know that. And that's a terrific thing to read about. The optimism in there is fantastic. You know, yeah. here's somebody – when people hear that word schizophrenia, Nick, Hollywood yes. has ruined that word. It has. And here's the thing. Uh I, I know I know where this comes from. I I, I feel like I have a good understanding of this. Mm -hmm. It's because it's you know Hollywood looks for something that's real, but still mysterious. Right. Because if it's mysterious, you can turn it into whatever you want, and you can make it exciting. Right. Case in point. Think about movies about Mars. Okay. If you think back to movies about Mars back in the 40s and 50s. It was these aliens from Mars who are coming to Earth and they're, they're uh, you know, going to take over the planet. Movies about Mars today are nothing like that. Right. And the reason why is because there's no more mystery about it. Right. We understand it. So it no longer makes a, a, a impact on, on movies. Right. right. I feel like schizophrenia and mental illness were kind of going the same direction. I think in 10 or 15 years, we're not going to have movies about schizophrenia like we do now or that we have in the last 20 years, you know, mm. where it's like ooh, somebody's got schizophrenia and they're a, a crazy murderer and killing people. Right. right. And that's because no one understood it. Yes. We're understanding it more now. And so we're we're removing the, the mystery behind that. And yes. we're – it, it doesn't make for a good movie anymore. But, um, yeah, that, that has been something that has been bothering me for a long time. And mm. there's so many bad mental health <laughs> oh, diagnoses in movies. Yeah. And, you know, the, the reason that those things are now uh, – the, the mysteries are being ripped away is because of people like Betsy. Because yes. Betsy's coming forward and saying, um, hey, this is what my life is really like. But I'm also the one who just served you your chicken wings. <laughs> and so, right. like, and I didn't kill you, yo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, you know, you're welcome. And, you know, please don't fear me. And also, you know, she has such an encouraging message in there to try to help people understand – this therapy is good. Therapy works. And, you know, don't be all of the above about it. You know, medicine has its role. Therapy has its role. Coping skills has its role. Adjusting my life to match, you know, myself and the best version of me has its role. But, oh, my goodness, you know, five years of real progress and seeing how much she's come and how far she's come. Schizophrenia is, is this thing that a lot of people don't understand. And, and so let's take a quick second just to reveal mm -hmm. a little bit of it because we want to destigmatize it by just talking about what it really is. Schizophrenia is a fun and exciting word because it, it's very German. And, you know, what it actually comes <laughs> down to is it, it means a ripped apart consciousness. And when they were first describing it, what they noticed was how she said, I'm inconsistent with my reality, that sometimes I have these little disagreements with my reality. And what that means is there's an incongruence in perception. That's usually mm -hmm. what schizophrenia is. So things that we might see with somebody that exhibits signs of schizophrenia, and there's kind of like a continuum of schizophrenia. There's lots of different you yeah. know, little caveats to it. But the classic symptoms are things like flat affect, which to us means you, you might not emote. You might not be channeling like the emotional waves that the rest of us are, like following along. You sort of seem a little flat and a little uh, detached from whatever the reality of the moment is. We might see uh, paranoia, which she describes in here too, uh, which is that feeling of being watched or that feeling of hypervigilance. 
vigilance, like you're constantly having to look at your surroundings and you never feel you know, consistently safe. She talked about emotional non-existence, which is that flat affect or opposite effect, which is that disagreement of what reality is actually throwing at her. Anxiety is very common. And you know, for some people, they'll also describe uh, this thing that she described called an out-of-body situation or dissociation. And so dissociation is whenever you sort of feel like a passenger in your life instead of the pilot and you're almost feeling like you're watching your life happen like a movie and you're not completely dialed into it and it's sort of this passive representation. And then lastly, whenever schizophrenia is unmanaged, some people will describe having visual or audio hallucinations or delusions. And we've talked about it on the show before. A hallucination is seeing something or hearing something that others do not. It's probably not there. And a delusion is an untrue interpretation of my reality. So if I feel paranoid, 